Welcome back to the Wizard Shop. Today we're going to talk about engine swaps and the problems that you will have later down the road after the swap, right after this. So I'm sitting here with two vehicles that at some point or another were going to have an engine swap or they were attempted. My Cadillac, we're going to put an old 350 diesel in it, and we were going to put a Rolls-Royce engine in this old C30. Luckily, we never got them done. It, we're going to leave them stock. We're putting them back stock. It just turned out to be too much trouble, and I really didn't want to tear up this truck. But you guys got to keep in mind that when you do an engine swap, you're going to have to alter the wiring. A lot of the modules or electronics, any kind of electronics there is, is no longer going to match up to a factory schematic. You do the swap, everything works great, you drive the car for a few months and all of a sudden it starts having trouble. Or, like a scenario I'm going to show you here in a minute, you sell the vehicle to someone else and they may not be mechanically inclined and it starts having issues, it starts having trouble. You take that resto mod vehicle to a shop, the time that they're gonna charge you is no longer by the book because the work they're doing is no longer by the book. You're gonna pay hour by hour by hour for every hour that they work on it. Where a job should have taken an hour or two to get done and it ends up taking five because you had to figure out what did the last guy do? You're gonna pay for those five hours. So it's gonna be very expensive. Let's go take a look at the scenario we have in the shop today. This is the first week in Kansas right now that it's gonna start being really hot. It's gonna get almost 100 a couple of days this week and it's pretty hot today. I'm very, very thankful at this time for Vornado for sending us several different fans. They got a floor fan, several of these pedestal fans, some fans that mount to Junior Mint's toolbox. They did this in the winter and I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. It doesn't really help us right now but I sure am thankful for them right now. It is really hot. So thank you, Fornado, for the fans that are keeping us cool here at Omega Auto Clinic. This is a 1973 Corvette Stingray, and it is a resto mod. It's been modified heavily. The customer is a very nice customer who owns this, and we're not going to knock this car today. We're not going to talk bad about it, but we're going to use it as an example of what you can get yourself into when you buy a resto mod that somebody else has done, and you may not be that mechanically inclined yourself really not get under the hood and see what's going on. So we're going to take a look under the engine bay today and show you some things. And we're gonna raise it up, talk about what we're gonna to do to this car, why it's here, and some of the pitfalls of having a swapped vehicle. So let's go ahead and get the hood open and let's see what's under the hood. This car is really beautiful. It's an excellent looking car, but when I first got it in the shop and I opened the hood, I kind of grimaced. And it wasn't because of what's in there, but because I knew what was to come. So this thing, obviously, by looking at it, it's been LS swapped. And I think they did a pretty good job, but it retains a lot of the electronic ignition. You have to on an LS motor. There's no provision for a distributor. But the unfortunate thing for me that I see as a downfall is that it has a carburetor. Now this is done for a lot of the old school mechanics or at home do-it-yourself mechanics where they don't want have to diagnose or mess with fuel injection or trying to make fuel injection work. This can come off as a little cheaper to do, but I personally don't like carburetors. And maybe that's not just a personal thing, but you'd be surprised in shops today that you take them a carbureted vehicle. They don't even work on them anymore. We will here in this shop. I, I know carburetors. My mentor was a carburetor master. I mean, an absolute master at them. And I did pick up a lot of his tricks along the way. I don't consider myself a master, but I can definitely work on them. It's very possible that you could take this vehicle to a shop and they would just put it right back outside and say, nah, we don't mess with carburetors. A lot of younger guys in the shop, they don't know anything about a carburetor and they don't want to either. I personally would have kept this vehicle fuel injected because I absolutely love fuel injection. I fully understand it. And that would have been simpler to me to work on than a carburetor. But this is the one of the things that you run into is having overfueling issues. It's running rich, it's running rough, and you're looking at an LS motor, and everything that I know about an LS motor as far as fueling goes out the window. Now we're dealing with a carburetor, a completely different story. Now I'm think 
you have to think on the ignition like an LS motor. But on the fueling system, you have to think about like a 78 Cadillac, 65 Chevy. You have to have two different mindsets to work on the same motor. Hey, Car Wizard, uh, hmm? what kind of carburetor is that? This is a Demon carburetor. It says Demon right here. These are very high performance race carburetors. They're very good carburetors. I'm not knocking them. This one happens to be a four barrel. I'm sure when it's tuned up right, it runs very well, works. But who are you gonna have to get it right? I recommended to this customer for those issues, take it to a race shop because they will be able to put it on a dyno and dial in the fuel ratios perfectly. I don't have that capability here. I could get this thing running pretty good, but for what he has here, I recommend that he get it dialed in perfect. So at all stages of having to throttle open or load on the engine, there's the proper amount of fuel going into it. I can't hook a scan tool to this and check that out. It's gonna to have to have a gas analyzer in the tailpipe while they set this up. I don't have a gas analyzer. So I really recommend him go to a tuning shop or a race shop, and he's going to do that. I think he'll get the best bang for his buck for that. As you see, with the heater hoses right here, there's been a lot of modification done there. There's no way from the dash to actuate this heater valve. You have to get under the hood and do it. There's lots of wiring, as you see here, that's been modified. There's relays and things. What does this relay do? What does this one do? What do these wires go to? There's no manual you're going to look at. Now I'm not complaining because I can fully find out what everything is. I have the full capability to do that. Here's where the problem comes in. The customer didn't anticipate paying that kind of money. Now this guy's done, he's fine. But there may be a customer that doesn't want to pay for that. They're like six hours just to find out what's going on with my car? You bet. Maybe the problem lies in the modification itself. They didn't do it right. And I won't know that until I get everything apart and go through every wire, every sensor, every relay and figure out what's going on. I can't rely on a schematic. There isn't one for this. Carl, is it, could you ask your mechanic to actually kind of make a map of what's under the hood? Sure. He could draw up a diagram and something that could keep with the car. But there again, you're going to pay for that. I personally wouldn't spend the time to write up something like that for 10 bucks. It's gonna be 75, 85 an hour. But it would totally be worth it because you would be able to have that with you when you bring it back to that shop or if you're out of town and you have to go to a different shop, you can say, hey, here's the diagram. This is where what everything goes. Or if you sell a vehicle. We're not going to be doing that on here because we're just focusing on a few items that he wants addressed. It could be very laborious to go through every single wire, all through the car, figuring out what's been modified, what hasn't been, hours and hours of work. That's not what's been asked to do here, but it can be done. It's a possibility. One of the reasons why it's here is because his air conditioner doesn't work. He's curious what's going on with that. We did hook the AC machine to it and pulled out the Freon. How much should it have? I don't know. The original system is gone. It has a hybrid system in it. It's half R12 components mixed with half R134 components. And therein lies some of our issues. We pulled the Freon out. I looked at the original R12 amount, and you usually take that times 0.8. That's something my mentor, one of my mentors told me, and it's been accurate all these years. And that gives you the R134 amount to put into the system. We put that amount in and the AC would turn on, but the pressures would skyrocket on the high side, almost 400 PSI. And I noticed the fan wasn't coming on. Now we're looking at more modifications. Somebody else wired this up. What did they do? What didn't they do? I don't know. Do you know? So let's take a look at some of the tricks and some of the things I did to figure out what's going on here. So here is an aftermarket controller mounted to the fan shroud. And we had to figure out, we turn on the AC, this fan should come on to help run the air over the condenser. That would be true on any car you would buy today, but it wasn't. So I thought, well, maybe the fan's non-functional. So I have the original relay removed, and I have, just like on my Amazon affiliates page, these are my relay switches. I can manually tell it to turn on and off. 
We're going to replace the original relay with this one. And now I can turn on the fan. So now we know that the fan works, but why, why isn't it not turning on? I'll put the original relay back in. And that's something I've yet to determine. We're going to have to trace through the switches, the pressure switch, the clutch switch. I may have to further modify this myself that when the clutch comes on, the fan comes on. No option in that matter, it just comes on. This leads us to the next thing with the air conditioning. Like I said, it has the old R12 condenser up front. Let's take a look. As you can see down in there, there's big, huge loops, like little elbow U-shaped pipes that stick out of it. That works great for R12. However, it is severely inefficient for R134. It doesn't cool the refrigerant like it should. So on a hot day, you better have some serious air moving across that. And that's what we're going to address is to make this thing run on high when he has the, the clutch engaged for the AC. I hooked the AC machine to this. We had the fan manually turned on and it would stay around 250, which is about normal. I don't know what it's going to do for him on a 105 degree day at a stoplight. It may get close to 300, which would still be somewhat acceptable. It's just not going to cool very well inside this car, and he may have to live with that. It does work. It does allow the AC to work when we have the fan running. I'm going to have to wire in a relay to make the fan come on when you turn the AC on. So that'll solve that problem. Luckily, the interior space is pretty small on this car, so it doesn't require a lot of cooling to keep him comfortable. So that'll be a thing to keep in mind. The next thing is, is he had a brake leak coming from the master cylinder. It's coming from the bottom where it mounts to the booster. He says that he would like to attempt to replace that himself. So I will leave that to him and be happy to let him do that. The next issue that he has is that there's possibly a leak coming from the rear main seal and he'd like to have that looked at and just check out the underside of the car. So let's get this thing up in the air and Take a look on the bottom side. So let's take a look under here and just from the front to back and see what we've got going on. Looks like it's had some upgraded brakes put on with some slotted or drilled rotors, which is nice. Looks like they've done ball joints and tie rod ends and sway bar bushings. That looks nice. Looks like they did a good job there. And it looks like they had to tie in some different lines here for the transmission cooler. Make sure nothing's loose there. Nice and tight. Nice and tight. Looks like some power steering components have been replaced here and everything looks nice and new. So that's working pretty good for him. He doesn't have any issue there. So as we look up inside of here in this, you can see there's a little module there. It looks to me like a cruise control module, or, but what is that module? It's not a 1973 Corvette setup, I can tell you that. You can see where his brake booster was leaking. It's wet up on the bottom of it. You can see a receiver dryer up inside of there. That's R134. I just wonder why they didn't put a condenser that matches that, but that's okay. It should work okay. This is a special oil pan that must be for the LS swap into a Corvette. It's almost like a, the wings of a bird. It's kind of flared out here. That allows you to have the stock capacity of oil without having a pan that sticks down too far. Otherwise, it would drag the oil pan on the ground or it could hit when you go over railroad tracks and you definitely don't need that. So I do see a leak going on here, but we'll take a look at that here in a minute. I'm gonna show you guys the rest of the car and then we'll come right back to what's going on here. As you can see, the exhaust has been hard welded, except for here at the X pipe. So that means we'll be able to remove it somewhat easy. And 
Everything else is looking stock back here. It's got some upgraded brakes. It's got new shocks, some new brake hoses. That's nice. Brakes look fairly new. It's got a, a new spring here, a leaf spring, transverse leaf spring. Brakes look good. We're just doing a quick check over and showing you guys everything that's been done to this. It has some flow masters on it. But not too much modification back here. The exhaust is a little bit aftermarket. So let's go ahead and take a look at this transmission leak up here. I see that somebody has glued a little pad here like they're trying to hide a leak. Now, to an untrained eye, you would look at that and say, huh, whatever, you know, no big deal, but it is a big deal. Somebody knew this was leaking, and maybe when they tried to sell it, they glued that on, or I don't, I'm not sure who did that, but they're trying to hide a leak here. Let's soak it up instead of letting it drip on the ground. We have taken this torque converter cover off, and the front seal of the transmission is leaking very, very bad. As you can see, there's red fluid right here. Red transmission fluid that is not engine oil. And this little pad here is just soaked. Look at that, guys. Soaked in transmission fluid. It's been leaking pretty heavily for a little while. Okay, I'm back. I just went to wash my hands. I don't want all that stuff soaked into my skin. But we're going to have to remove this transmission. We're going to start on that. We already have the okay to do it. We will have to unbolt this exhaust and kind of undo the exhaust to get this out. Take this cross member out. It's not going to be that big of a job, really. We'll get that taken care of for them and try to get as much thing as we can here taken care of to make this a much better experience for him on his car. But like I said, with the tuning on the fuel system, he's going to have to go to a race shop and get that taken care of. So let's take a look at the car, actually look in the interior and take a look around it and let you guys check it out. So you can tell it's not original paint, but they did a pretty good job when they painted it. The body's not cracked or broken. A lot of this stuff's fiberglass. Uh, it's in pretty good shape, the body. Let's take a look at the interior. The interior is in very, very good shape. It's got, the seats have been redone. The dash has been fixed up and it's got a nice cover on it. It's got 67,000 miles on it, which I would say that that's accurate because the car is in pretty good shape. It's got several different gauges, like a Corvette does. Aftermarket stereo. It's got like a little pocketed leather pocket over there by the glove box. That's not stock, I don't believe, but it looks nice. The door panels look nice. It does have a, a crack in the windshield in the, the right side. I did notice that. But the interior really is in pretty good shape. I really appreciate how nice it is. It's really pretty good. Let's take a look around the back. Got the nice quintessential Corvette rear end, four brake lights, nice looking exhaust. And the paint's pretty good back here too. Really nice. Whoever painted it knew what they were doing. They did a good job. Got some aftermarket bullet style wheels on it. I'm not sure. Krager style, whatever you call those. Nice looking wheels. This side's in good shape. No cracks, no broken fiberglass. I do see a little bit up here, like a little crack in the fiberglass by the, the headlamp here. That looks like it was done after the paint job. Who knows what the story is there, but it does have a little crack there. So this is a really beautiful car and the customer who owns it, I really enjoy doing business with him. He's very very understanding. He knows that it's going to cost money to fix a resto mod car and he's fully aware of it. I'm really happy about that. I've been through this scenario a few times where the cost starts getting up there and the customer actually pulls the work out because they're like this is more than I had planned or budgeted to spend and it never fails. They go to two or three other shops looking for a better deal and they actually come back to me because they're like wow I went to a couple other shops and it was even more than you quoted. 
you have to keep that in mind when you're shopping Craigslist, Marketplace, bring a trailer, and you see this really cool resto mod. You're going to have to keep in mind that if you can't work on it yourself and you're taking it to a shop, it's going to be way more than you think it is to get it repaired because it's going to take the mechanic that much more time to figure out what's been done to this car. How did they address this issue? How did they make this work? And to get to the bottom of the issues that you have. When you go to look at prospectively buying one of these, maybe ask the owner if they have a diagram or maybe the person who did the work maybe wrote up a diagram of what they did. That would be helpful to save time to the, the next mechanic working on it, that they could just look at this diagram and then diagnose it a lot faster, saving you some diagnosis time. If you're a do-it-yourself mechanic and you are under the hood fixing some of these issues, write up your own diagram and give that to the next guy who purchased it down the road. It will save them some time and some headaches as well. I actually had an uncle that had an IROC that had been converted over to a different engine and a lot of different things, and it was a lot of money he had to spend to get it right. It was not very well done at all. By the time he got it done, he spent what he bought on the car again getting the thing right. So that's something you have to keep in mind with a resto mod. There are a lot of them you've seen on Barrett Jackson or Meekum. They're done really well. And that's why they cost 50 and 60 and 100 grand because they spent a lot of time to do it right. If you're buying a resto mod car for 10, 15 grand, 20 grand, there may be some corners cut. You may want to check into that. Before you buy one, take it to your reputable mechanic or the local mechanic and have them give it an inspection. That may save you some money there. You say, you know what? Based on what I see here, I'm going to offer you a little bit less money for your car. You might be wondering why this has an LS motor in it. The reason why is because they wanted modern horsepower. It bolts up to the GM transmission that was in here. And it's pretty easy to get it to work in this scenario. You can have electronic ignition. These engines put out a lot of power when they are modified. Way more than just your standard 350 from back in the day. So it's a good choice for an engine. They're not that expensive to buy, and they're not that hard to make work inside of an older vehicle. That's why it has an LS motor in it. There is a huge aftermarket for these engines doing swaps. Massive. That's also one of the reasons why it has that. Parts are quite plentiful. They're in stock. The water pump you could get for a Corvette or even a Tahoe or whatever the water pump they use to make it work in this application. So any of the tools you're curious if I use, especially the little relay kit that I used to test the fans, that's also for sale in my Amazon Affiliates link in the description below. If you haven't clicked the subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. we got many, many more cool videos to come. There's a lot of cars coming in the shop, which means more videos for you guys. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.